Right, we presentation from uh, Harafa and uh, present is Ben and Anita and Lee Redshaw somewhere and um, yep. Um, Bern, do you want to come up and have a brief introduction to introduce the item and perhaps Anita, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it wasn't a seven year itch, the Maritime Museum, was <laughs> I just, uh, just thought of as they walked out the door. Um, uh, thank you once again for the opportunity for the amenities to present to uh, councillors. It's an opportunity really for them to give you an overview of how they are contributing <coughs> to the city uh, and what the funding represents in terms of making Auckland a great place to live and work. Uh, so I'm going to just allow them to self-introduce, Mr Chairman, if you're <coughs> happy with that. Uh, and uh, I'm sure councillors will have questions of the amenities after their brief presentation. Right, well, you start with New Zealand Opera, Stuart. Um, and I think everyone knows, um, sorry, the Opera, the Philharmonia, the Rescue Helicopter and Water Safe, that it's approximately 10 minutes, um, give or take, um, and questions included. So, but we can be a bit flexible. Oh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, uh, uh, can I just introduce our chair, yep. Mr John Harvey? Yep, welcome, Sir John. Chair, members of the um, Finance Committee and uh, other councillors, it's a great uh, opportunity to, uh, for New Zealand Opta, Opera to be able to present today, and I will leave Stuart to present in a moment uh, on the significant achievements that we have, th have made this year. But before that, I thought it would be useful for everybody if I just gave a brief update on our, our governance, because I think it links in very clearly, very closely to what the Council and the Committee are expecting of us. Auckland is a diverse, culturally rich city, and we believe the Board of New Zealand Opera needs to reflect that. Early last year, Jim He joined our board, and Jim is a Chinese New Zealand citizen. He's very active in the Chinese committee, uh, community, and he's involved in the Asian arts scene, including the Chinese Lantern Festival. Uh, he's a very valuable addition to the board. More recently, Witi Ihimaira has agreed to join the board. Now, Witi is a prominent uh, Maori leader with significant involvement in all areas of the arts. So I think that's a, a real coup as far as we are concerned, and, and really the, those two appointments will assist us greatly in developing our strategies to ensure we are serving the diverse communities in which we operate. So that was all I want to say from a governance point of view. <coughs> and over to Stuart. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, ladies and gents, for giving us a chance to strut our stuff. As the uh, councillors would know, the Auckland plan uh, calls for a culturally rich and creative Auckland and expects that our arts and culture will thrive, unite, delight, challenge and entertain and also drive wealth and prosperity for individuals and for Auckland. Well, we at New Zealand Opera are proud to support Auckland Council's vision to make this the most livable city and we believe that includes having a resident provider of opera in the many and varied theatres in this great city. Now, Auckland is the heart of New Zealand Opera's activity. We live, we work, we rehearse and manufacture in this city. And consequently, over our $8.5 million annual budget, over 64% is spent in Auckland and its environs. We've increased the number of Aucklanders attending opera activity, we've increased the number of people employed in the creative sector, and we've increased the number of annual guest nights in Auckland for those attending and working on our performances. And I'm also happy to report that for the fourth successive year, we've posted a modest surplus and we're enjoying our third year in positive equity. And all this has been achieved by increasing our reach. 2017 was a great year for us. Uh, nationwide, we've increased our output from 21 main stage performances in 2016 to 35 in 2017, 21 of which were in Auckland, as well as four performances of large scale co-presentations. On the main stage, we've presented Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado, Bizet's Carmen, Janacek's Kacha Kabanova, and a new New Zealand work, The Bone Feeder, as well as opera and concert performances of Manon Lescaut and The Damnation of Faust. We've paid to a playing audience of over 28,000 across the country, 11,000 of those in Auckland. And in <coughs> addition, over 3,500 people have attended our numerous free outdoor concerts, all of which have been produced in Auckland. These concerts would be impossible for us to deliver without the significant support from Auckland Council's free outdoor event arm and, of course, Auckland Live. 
The company's education and outreach engagements in Auckland have grown from around 2,000 people back in 2013 to over 14,000 in 2017. And in this area, we continue to grow. This year, we'll see over 4,000 kids in the Auckland region see our new school show. Over 1,000 will attend a dress rehearsal. And this year, we've already presented a new New Zealand work as part of the Pride Festival, Live Drag, and workshopped a new Tim Finn work, Star Navigator, Star Navigator, pardon, for production in 2018-19. So we believe that New Zealand Opera is a vital thread in this city's cultural fabric. The National Opera Company is part of what we believe makes Auckland a memorable place to live and visit. And in line with the Auckland plan, we've recognised the growing diversity of Auckland's population, particularly in the Asian, Pacifica and Māori communities. And we're breaking down those perceived barriers of our art form to these communities and are proudly employ more people from the Asian, Pacifica and Māori communities than any other heritage art form. Our three emerging artists this year are Māori, Tongan and Samoan. All are cast in our school's company and specific tours are planned to target Auckland schools with a large Māori Pacifica population. We're also featuring the great Darren Penapate of, of Solomio fame in our Elixir of Love and have planned a number of uh, initiatives to bring South Auckland secondary and tertiary students in particular into the theatre to experience this opera. And in 2019-20, our presentation of Star Navigator will offer an opportunity to engage with the Māori and Tahitian communities, given its specific storyline and supporting programs of workshops will run alongside those main stage performances. And also at New Zealand Opera, we proudly celebrate the New Zealand bit. Uh, we harness Auckland's wealth of talent by employing local performers, designers and technicians, particularly the company's chorus of local singers, often recent, recent graduates from our tertiary institutions. And for every production, we of course employ the city's great orchestra, the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra, this year for three operas, and we collaborate on an opera in concert with them as well. We have a policy of presenting New Zealand singers wherever po possible, and many now have thriving international careers, and we endeavour to bring them back to literally give them a voice at home. And these expat singers, in addition to the local singers, are in addition to the local singers we are showcasing in principal roles, and over 150 local singers in our choruses across the country, and 60 in Auckland alone. And I have to say, this policy of employing New Zealand singers wherever possible has built a loyal following amongst our patrons and has con contributed significantly to our rise in our benefaction income. Speaking of which, similar to most arts and cultural organisations worldwide, uh, we are under growing pressure to increase our earned and generated revenue and to reduce our reliance on contributed income sources. In these interesting economic times, collaboration is clearly the name of the game. And we're passionate about bringing opera to as wide an audience as we possibly can. And collaborations with our Auckland-based partners uh, provide us with a great way to continue to deliver challenging and varied repertoire to our audiences. In 2018, for example, we're represented in the Auckland Festival with a new production of Bernstein's Candide, opening on Friday, put in your diaries, and in the APO season of Aida in concert later on in July. And we continue to engage all communities through our education and outreach activities, targeting ages from school children to seniors through workshops, tours, pre-performance talks, schools, operas, community events and dress rehearsal attendance. We've engaged people of all ages and given many potential new audiences their first taste of opera. Now, the Auckland Regional Amenities Funding also helps us fund the rent and utilities for our offices and rehearsal spaces in our opera centre at Parnell. Uh, we will be holding our second open day at the premises on the April 29, and we'd love to see you all come along. We also actively encourage other organisations to make use of the Opera Centre as a creative hub. So I believe that this company has developed into a progressive and dynamic opera company which presents truthful work that we believe is both musically and theatrically thrilling. And the fact that we are... Resident in Auckland means that this city can experience high quality operatic fare and increase, experience it with increasing regularity. So what does our 2018 look like? We've just finished a very successful season of Tosca in Christchurch and in Auckland we look forward to welcoming you to our new production of Candide from this Friday to Sunday in the town hall downstairs, looking like you've never seen it before. And in June we open our new production of Donizetti's Elixir of Love and finally Puccini's classic La Boheme in September, completely built and rehearsed in Auckland. 
and our outreach and education activities continue to grow. Now, we know that our, our presence in the nation's most populated city serves to enhance Auckland as a, a livable, a vibrant, sophisticated city, and we hope the world's most livable city. And we've got no doubt that the grant monies allocated by Auckland Regional Amenities Fund are more than doubled in worth of services, in visitors to this city, in eateries, in hotels, in local employment. We thank you, uh, Auckland Council, for your continued support. We could not plan and deliver the program that we do without this certainty of, of funding. It's been an absolute game changer for our organisation. So uh, thank you very much and we'll see you all at the opera. Thank you, Stuart. As usual, um, extremely well articulated um, questions. Thank you, Simpson. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, my question is around financial, your, your sort of financial results, because obviously we're the fund of last resort. So how has your funding gone over the last year, and how are you finding things like sponsorship and ability to, to raise money uh, to do what you do is your number one priority? Look, corporate sponsorship, I would have to say, is still an extremely difficult um, to figure to, to come up with. We, um, we've done extremely well in benefaction. Our benefaction income has increased over, over 50,000 last year, and we believe that that's probably the area that we are going to be able to most make most gains. And that's what I was meaning about this idea of employing New Zealanders when we can. That seriously has been a, a, a major push towards that. Um, we've certainly done very well with our trusts and foundations as well, but trusts and foundations tend to want to fund sexy projects, education projects, uh, and, and specific things. So it's very hard to find funding for main stage activity. So we've concentrated on, on trying to reduce our overheads and, and reducing our spend, um, and um, uh, trying to be as clever as we can in order to make our funding envelope go as far as it can. And Hannah, do you have a, um, a calculation of how much you spend and how many people through the turnstile? Uh, not specifically. We wouldn't. I could probably get at the calculator and give it a go. Uh, the, th the thing we were talking about, the 18,000 people that we... Um, at, at that attended the operas last year were absolutely paying audience. We have a lot more people with each particular show that actually see our work, of course, because they are part of council or the various councils that we uh, go to. But uh, we don't have it on. I don't have that to hand, unfortunately. And I think one of, one of the things is that the 3,500 people that we sort of attract to our uh, concert work, they're all free. That's free of charge, for example. Have you, have you ever... <coughs> try to uh, uh, get an a, a equivalence of, say, something like Polyfest, um, which has upwards of 100,000 people over three or four days, five days, um, and work out the, <coughs> the cost-benefit ratio um, and the, the pittance that Polyfest gets to run what is arguably the world's biggest Pacific festival, not mm -hmm. just the South Pacific, but the world's biggest. Uh, with respect, we'll never win that argument. And the reason we won't win the argument is because opera is an expensive art form. And if we are going to offer it, the reason it's expensive is because it is resource heavy. At any particular opera, you've got 250 people that are employed per performance, and that goes back into the economy. We employ, uh, for example, in Candide this week, a 65 a uh, piece of uh, Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra. We have a chorus of 32 on stage. We have a principal company of over 10. We <coughs> have a backstage company of something like 50 working on it at the moment. But we, we as an art form, are very expensive. I will agree with that. And I, I cannot do anything other than say, if Auckland wants opera, that's what it, it unfortunately costs. And we are doing as much as we can in order to, um, to deliver it. So, so <coughs> obviously you make money eh, out of your um, out of your business. Business, do you make money? No, we don't make money. This year we we made a um, we made a ten thousand dollar surplus by the skin of our teeth. So we basically 
we get into the into the coffers 8.5 million during the year and we spend pretty much 8.5 million we believe that we are funded in order to create as much work as is humanly possible for this for for the singers and uh, people that that work backstage that people that work in the orchestras etc that's, so that's the, ad value, uh, the, vetted, uh, the added value for for Auckland city i believe so yes Cool. Uh, I, I wouldn't be in this chair if I didn't believe that people's lives are enriched by going to some of the great heritage art forms. And I defy people to go to something like AIDA and not feel thrilled. I went to the one in um, Mount Smart years ago. Great. Cool. Yes. Got time so to it is, again. I must admit, <laughs> it is about preservation, whether it's a bill of money to a degree as well as preservation of heritage art Absolutely. forms. Absolutely. And, and if we as a sophisticated city want to see those things die out, that would be um, a terrible indictment of us around this table, I believe. So, um, you, Stuart, do you um, broadcast like the APO concerts? And, and the APO have also seemed to have extended their broadcasting around the world through Surrey and Medium. I'm not sure if how they do it, but some sort of portals or whatever do you...? Uh, no, we haven't, um, uh, Mr Chair, we haven't uh, gone down that track at the moment and I'll let Barb talk about that later on in the more... The, uh, we haven't actually discussed it. What we did do uh, last year in two... Th well, no, actually, it was two years ago now, we did film our uh, Tosca, which went round the country, uh, basically on the back of the fact that we were broadcasting it through um, the Radio New Zealand, and a company wanted to bring in seven cameras in order to, to do a, a feed. Honestly, that hasn't paid back um, at all, but it's done great things for our reach. Uh, if you look at the Metropolitan Opera, for example, they, they invest something like $400,000 American dollars every time they do a broadcast. And the unfortunate thing is that it hasn't done anything to increase audiences worldwide. The people that tend to go to those operas tend to be people that have already bought to go to live opera. It's a value add rather than an instead of. And my last question was, I'm aware you were, for some operas, whether it was last year or the year before, you were bringing in sets from Australia that had already been constructed. Do you still do that? I'm sure it's more cost effective in some ways, or is that a mix of what? Um, it's certainly a mix. So for example, Candide is completely built here. Um, and Bohem will be completely built here, a designer built here at the end of the year. The Elixir of Love that we're doing is uh, a production from Australia. Uh, I have to say that one of the joys is that we've also ex exported New Zealand opera productions to around the world. So our production of Madaba Butterfly went to Seattle last year. Our production of Tosca went to Perth last year. Our production of Madaba Butterfly will go to Australia at the end of next year. Uh, the Tosca set has been sold to Australia as well. So it's, it's a give and take. And nobody can afford not to be part of the global opera yep. community. Yep. Yep. All right, well, thank you very much to John. Thank you, Stuart. Um, there's no resolution because it's a wrap-up at the end, but we thank you and thank you for the work you do and the work your board does, Sir John. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your support. All right, the Auckland Philharmonia, we have... Um, Barbara and two board members that will be introduced, who many of us know. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, Lee. <coughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Finance Committee, and thank you for allowing us to present to you this morning. Um, I'm Richard Abbott. I've been on the board of the Philharmonia since 2005, and it's worth reflecting that at that time, was a very different organisation from the one it is today. It was a players' cooperative with very challenging governance and principally funded by a remote Wellington um, organisation, uh, physically remote. Um, the organisation today is unrecognisable, largely as a result of being fully embraced by the Auckland Council through ARAFA, the RFA um, and other arts organisations and it gives us great pleasure to present to you our current situation and recent achievements as Auckland's professional orchestra. Uh, Thank you Richard. Um, I just thought I'd start off by reading you some feedback we've had recently. Hello from Oregon USA. This is heavenly and with music being a universal language, this should surely soothe the heart of the most devilish person. 
Hello darling people, this is such a beautiful way to start my day. I'm watching from Cape Town, South Africa. Bravo. Thank you from Seattle, USA. In Britain, some of my opera friends with their snobbery keep belittling Classic FM radio by saying I should only tune into BBC Radio 3. Well, this stream production proves how wrong they are, singing at its glorious best. Good morning from the Ukraine. Hello from Wales. Good, good afternoon from Indonesia. The viewing is truly global. Royal Opera House, The Met and La Scala could learn from this approach. Thank you so much for your live stream, watching from Bangkok, Thailand. New Zealand are watching from the Philippines, many fond memories of APO concerts in Auckland Town Hall. This is beautiful. Good morning from Derry, Ireland. Just came across this by accident. What a pleasure to be watching this in England at 8.40 a.m. So that's just an example of the terrific feedback we've had, and that was actually a live stream of last year's opera in concert, Manon Lesko, which we had an enormous amount of support from New Zealand Opera. So although they're not able to do their own productions, fully staged productions, they certainly do get out into the full world through, through their collaboration with us. So some of our key achievements from the 16-17 year, it was our first full year resident in Auckland Town Hall and we're now into our second. What that's meant for us is increased profile in the city. We really do feel now like we're part of the artistic heart of the city. We've been able to develop more collaborative relationships and closer relationships between the musicians and staff now that we're actually all in the same building for most of the time. And it's a great working environment for our staff and our staff are certainly more engaged with the activities of the council and I'd just like to welcome a big number of them who've come up this morning. Put your hands up, guys. There they are, see? Your, your staff, your orchestra. Um, so we've had a really great year in the last year. We continue to build our program, build our standards, and we've had some great concerts. Last year, we renewed our relationship, our, re our leadership with our music director, Giordano Bellincampi, who's made a massive difference to the orchestra, and our concert master, Andrew Beer. It's also been a breakthrough year in reaching, in the way that we've started to reach now, some of Auckland's diverse communities in new ways, and particularly our Maori and our Chinese communities. Um, you'll probably have seen in this morning's Herald that Auckland has just been named in the Mercer Quality of Living Surveys, the third most livable city in the world after Vienna and Zurich, an equal third with Munich. And I'd just like to point out that all of those cities are cities that really value their culture and I'm really proud that we can be up there with them and I'd like to think that the contribution that the organisations such as us and the Opera, the Festival and ATC have really contributed to that ranking and that Auckland Council will continue through ARAFA to support all of us. Um, this year we have also, we've also got our first international orchestral co-commission coming up in just a couple of weeks. We've joined with orchestras in the UK and America to commission a new work um, with, with funds that have been raised independently. Um, in calendar 17, we did 113 performances. 78 of those were self-presented concerts and the rest were collaborations and commercial hires. We had 56,000 people at APO at our self-presented APO concerts and 109,000 people saw us live in person and a further record number for us in total, including our live stream audience, over a quarter of a million people last year, 275,000 in fact. We did, in our APO Connecting program, our Education and Outreach program, we delivered on 190 days to 220, sorry, 27,000 students, including 3,500 participants. So that's people who aren't just sitting there watching but are actively engaged with our programs. These are students in over 64 schools across Auckland from decile 1 to 10 who get mentored, have musicians come into their schools and are really actively engaged with us. It's been a great time of collaboration for the APO and we're very proud of the collaborations with other institutions that make Auckland so great. In particular, New Zealand Opera, the Auckland Arts Festival, the Art Gallery, the Museum, Atamira Dance Company, Auckland Live, the South Auckland community in a number of different ways and across a number of different um, venues and schools and Vodafone Event Centre. So we're really happy with how all of that's tracking. 
Given that we are really proudly our city's orchestra, we take a lot of care to align with the Auckland plan so that our delivery also serves the larger strategic purpose for the city. And in the packs we've handed out, you'll see the details of some of that. We've been quite specific in how we align to the Auckland plan, in particular strategic directions one, three and six out of the Auckland plan. And if you can't remember what they are, it's creative, creating a strong, inclusive and equitable society, integrating arts and culture into everyday life and developing an economy that delivers opportunity and prosperity to all Aucklanders and to New Zealand. And one thing that I perhaps should specially mention in the last year is that apart from our own work, we've been really pleased to notice the increase in hires for the orchestra from commercial outfits that are coming through Auckland and choosing to stop here because there's a world-class orchestra that they can employ. And um, some of you might have had the opportunity to go and see Harry Potter, the, the movie with live orchestra last year in Spark Arena. We had the film <coughs> composer Hans Zimmer in Auckland and did a concert with APO again at Spark Arena last year. We had a Led Zeppelin tribute group that, that was very successful in the AAT Centre and perhaps one of the artistic highlights of recent decades actually was our concert last October with Anna Netrebko. She's the, probably the world's greatest soprano, living soprano. She was doing an 11 city international world tour and she chose Auckland and APO as her only appearance in New Zealand. So we were incredibly proud of that and it was a, a really fantastic concert sold out in the ATA mm. Centre. And of course, just recently, we supported the English National Ballet doing Giselle, and this week we're playing for the opera doing Candide. So it's been a really, really fantastic last year and this year. In terms of our key objectives going forward, the board has recently approved a new five-year plan, and areas of focus for us will be artistic excellence and quality development, ensuring that we are and remain a key <coughs> part of the Auckland brand. Uh, our diversity strategy is, is really important to us given the diversity of Auckland and we're continuing to, to focus on Chinese, Pacifica and Māori audience development. And you'll see in the packs that I've handed out, one of the things we're really proud to have achieved last year was a um, education uh, resource for, uh, the, for Kura Kaupapa and we circulated that to all of the relevant schools and we've had fantastic feedback about that as well. Um, we can't meet demand in our education initiatives at the moment and that's an ongoing issue for us. And um, we're just trying to work with our communities to ensure that we can continue to grow and thrive. New initiatives coming up, we've got a concept, we've, we're developing different audience streams and so this year for the first time we've noticed that there's not a lot of family orchestral concerts so this year for the first time we're doing two new kinds of events, one at Bruce Mason Centre, um, the composer is dead which is a kind of murder mystery live with orchestra and um, in July we're doing the Gruffalo movie with live orchestra as a children's concert and we're, we're doing that twice and it's selling really well and in just a couple of weeks we're doing uh, a concert with the group Leisure in the Auckland Town Hall, a new initiative for us, the concert will start at 9 o'clock at night <coughs> and we sold 200 tickets in the first day so we're really happy about that and that's, a, that's again a new direction for us just to engage a younger and different audience and I think that'll be really successful as well. So very happy to be here. Thank you again. We couldn't be doing any of this without Auckland Council's support through the ARAFA board and we're very grateful for the support that we get. So thank you and I'm happy to, we are all happy to take questions. Councillor Katie. Uh, thanks Barbara. I hope everybody's had the chance to read the supplementary mm. information that's been on our table because one part of it really gives me great cause for concern and I'm glad there's a lot of um, new musicians here. It's on our page six of this document here. Maybe you'd like to expand on the three paragraphs or the four paragraphs relative to paying <coughs> musicians. It really worries me that you're saying basically that the current rates are not remotely competitive. That must mean that you're losing staff and that you're unable to attract musicians and keep them. Mm. So tell me, how does that all work? What's the, what's the budget for your musicians and um, do they have a union? <laughs> and has there been any history of striking? <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Barbara um, respond to the, whether they belong to a union or not. But um, can, I, can I say, and, and um, Mr Chairman, um, councillors, um, Mr Mayor, um, one of the key issues that our board um, 
is continuously focusing on is our remuneration. It is sort of one of our key challenges um, going forward. We've done um, a, re a substantial amount of work around that um, with benchmarking um, with other operas, in fact, and within New Zealand with other organisations, including yourselves, um, around where our um, players and our administration sit. So I don't want to go into the detail of what that looks like, but it is one of the things that we are challenged to, to um, enhance. Um, and I think one of the key things it is to, to resolve that is the relationship with um, ARAFA. Um, and, some, and probably uh, the New Zealand government, because this is an area which is hard to actually fund through uh, philanthropy or corporate sponsorship. And so it's one of the issues we do have with um, RAFA. We would like to see, um, and I'm treading on delicate position because I'm aware of your debt revenue ratio, Mr. Mayor, um, but, but the reality is, you know, monies are returned from RAFA, and I understand that. Um, back to, to the council, and I guess from an arts perspective, um, we believe that um, maybe some of that money could be released um, to actually allow us, and probably the, the arts community, to actually address this issue. Now, it's going to be bigger than that, and it's a conversation we have had with the RAFA, and we like to maybe um, uh, go back into that conversation, but we do need to address that. If in fact, we're going to retain and or attract um, you know, players, as well as administration, it's important to keep, keep running. Um, I can just answer the second part of your question. Our musicians are independent contractors, not employees, so they, they get paid when they work. Um, we guarantee them basically the amount of work that, that keeps them busy 95% of the time. Um, but they're not in a union. They're an extremely reasonable bunch of people to deal with. I, I worked... As many of you probably possibly know, I was um, from Australia. I worked in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra before I came to Auckland um, <laughs> over a decade in a ago now. And um, that was a unionised orchestra, like all the orchestras in Australia are. They're all employees. Our guys are not, em they're not employees and they're not unionised and they're, they're so easy to talk to and deal with in, in terms of that. But it is an increasing pressure. The remuneration issue is an increasingly important issue. As everybody knows, Auckland is not getting cheaper to live in and, you know, there's, there's not a lot of other options if you're choosing to be a musician and you're at the level that you can be a professional full-time musician, APO's it. So we really need to look after them. And as I'm sure you can understand, finding funding or finding money monies through sponsorship and philanthropy for salaries is not really possible. We people, trusts and also um, uh, sponsors want projects. Stuart referred to that before. And the, the biggest challenge for us is actually the funding of our infrastructure. We're a large organisation. We, we employ 100 full-time equivalents between our contractors and our staff, 72 in the orchestra and 28 in the staff. So it is a big personal personnel load to carry, and that does take a lot of money. Could I, could I just uh, one further um, uh, point? Um, Councillor Casey, I guess I, I mentioned um, uh, benchmarking. Um, we, we're benchmarking against the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra, similar sized city. Um, there is a big difference between what we are able to pay and what they are. So um, <coughs> without going into the detail of what that difference looks like, that's our benchmark. Um, clearly it's um, yeah, similar city, similar size orchestra. Well, Mr Chairman, the fact that the EPO has written these four paragraphs that leapt out the page at me, is there anything that, as a council we can do to assist in term, not I don't mean in direct <coughs> funding, but assisting the conversations that need to be had around this? It's a real problem. Well, um, some of us have been banging on about how the APO has been sweating its human assets for quite some time. It appears the capital assets and the buildings are going to be looked after quite nicely with the extension to our Tao Centre, but um, the bottom line is it's just really everyone listening time. around this table. Um, Lee did allude to the comparison to Adelaide. I believe that differential is something like 25%. Mm. So we're talking about very significant. So, um, so Barbara, could you just uh, explain um, the composition of your players? Um, are we finding it increasingly difficult to hold on to promising New Zealand players and, and therefore we are seem to be attracting, when I go to the concerts, obviously a lot of uh, 
players from Asia and from North America. Yes, and that I mean that's that's true of the. I think in the in recent times we've in about the last four or five years we've only appointed two New Zealanders and the rest have been North Americans and and. Asians. Now, in the long term, that's not a bad thing because, you know, they become Kiwis and they, you know, that's a great way to expand the sort of cultural footprint of the city, if you like. But it is slightly embarrassing that, that there's a lot of good Kiwi players in Wellington and offshore and they're not coming to the APO. So it's, it's not a question of they don't get the jobs, they don't even audition for us, a lot of them. So, and that's because it's, it's pretty clear that financially it's difficult. So it seems to be in that, that, that bracket, which includes teachers and nurses, and yes. et cetera, that's professions that are struggling to hold people in all That's right. Stuff. And we've benchmarked against all of those professions and we're underneath them, unfortunately. Well, thank you very much, um, Richard and Barbara and Lee. Um, giving you a little bit extra time there to, to focus on the, the human asset side of things. So appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Have thank you very day. much. Thank you. Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust, Greg and team. Or oh, Greg. Greg on your own. Good morning. Good morning, uh, councillors and um, Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you this morning and, uh, and particularly the opportunity to thank uh, the Auckland ratepayers for their continued support of the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust and uh, I acknowledge and uh, appreciate the work that the um, Auckland Regional Amendment Funding Board uh, do in supporting not just the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust but all uh, uh, currently 10 amenities. Um, from our point of view, um, your financial contribution is greatly appreciated. And my presentation today will, will begin with our financials. It will be an overview of uh, last financial year and the first half of this financial year. And then we'll, I would like to discuss our new helicopter project. And finally, um, I'd like to talk to you about the Mechanics Bay heliport. So for the, um, the year ending June uh, 2017, uh, we flew 1,024 missions. Total operational costs for those missions were $7.3 million. Each mission cost $7,135 and Auckland, the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust had to fund $3,784 for each mission flown. The mission cost is broken down into a $6,200 cost for the helicopter service and a $1,276 cost for the clinical services that we provide to the patient on board. And I might add that um, we don't receive any government funding from the clinic for the clinical outlay. Of the 1,024 missions flown, 693 were in the Auckland wards. The 480, sorry, the $450,000 grant received from the uh, from ARAFA funded 119 of the Auckland missions. We had a very successful year fundraising. Total funds raised were $11.1 million. This was 23.5% increase on the previous year. Our cost of fundraising was slightly above our target of 28 cents in the dollar. In the period, we achieved the cost of fundraising at 30 cents or 30%. So for every dollar that we raised, 70%, 70 cents was available to fund helicopter operations or capital projects. An independent valuation of our helicopter assets resulted in a 1.5% million dollar impairment on the carrying value of the trust helicopters. So at the year end, the net assets of the trust were $22.494 million, an increase of $1.652 million on the previous year. Uh, we are required to be airborne within 10 minutes during daylight hours and 20 minutes at night, and we achieved these targets at a rate of 96 and 92 per cent respectively. There were no reportable incidents or accidents and there were no <coughs> reportable medical incidents or events in the period. In the six months uh, to December 2017, we have flown 486 missions, which is a 7% decline when comparing the same period 
in the previous year. Total operations cost of 3.7 million, with a cost of admission uh, 7,664, which is broken down to $5,987 for the helicopter service and $1,676 for the clinical services provided. The 486 missions flown so far this year, 350 of them were in the Auckland wards, and money received from ARAFA has funded 48 of the Auckland missions. Total funds raised through fundraising activity was slightly over $5 million, which is within 1% of the, of the funds raised for the same period last year. The cost of fundraising this year is right on target at 28 cents in the dollar. Uh, there have, once again, there have been no reportable accidents or incidents, and we have, received, we have achieved our airborne targets 90% of the time during the daylight hours and 93% of the time at night. And once again, there have been no reportable, reportable medical events during the period. Um, ARHT has entered into an agreement with Leonardo Helicopters of Italy for the purchase of two AW169 helicopters and a sophisticated flight training device. Current planning will see one of these helicopters operational by calendar year end and the second one by April next year. There are three reasons why we have committed to this purchase. Our current helicopters are old, they are increasingly unreliable and the cost to maintain them is prohibitive. Modern helicopters are designed to higher safety standards. They are equipped with advanced technology which relieves pilot workload, enhances both capability and safety. The AW169 helicopter that we have chosen has a very large cabin giving our clinical teams access to both sides of the patient's body, which we see as a significant, significant step in providing best patient care. We've been saving aggressively for the past four years to raise the capital for this project, and at the time of the purchase, we will have between 85 and 90% equity in these two helicopters and the flight training device. We've elected to continue with this purchase despite the ongoing procurement process for rescue helicopter services being run by central government. This process continues to drag on, and our feeling is that it could drag, continue to do so for some time yet. I point out that the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust has been providing rescue helicopter services to the wider Auckland region for the past four decades, and due to the tremendous public support received, coupled with the fact that we run one of the most technically and clinically advanced services in the world, we are quietly confident about our future. However, if the worst was to happen and our services are no longer required, because of the considerable equity we will have in this new equipment, we could exit it and retire debt without any issue. I'd like to talk to you about the Mechanics Bay helipad. Um, Auckland's rescue helicopter is based at the Mechanics Bay helipad, and from that the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust operates its helicopters, hangars, helicopters, houses operational crew, and houses management and administration staff. The facilities are cramped, dated, and generally substandard, with a lack of room being the biggest issue. Other occupants at Mechanics Bay include the New Zealand Police Maritime Unit, the New Zealand Police Air Support Unit, the Auckland Harbour Master, Coast Guard and Surf Life Saving. The three main users of the heliport are the Auckland Rescue Helicopter, uh, Airwork who operate Auckland's police helicopter and the restaurant. And in 1988 <coughs> together they formed a company called Heliport Lease Holdings and this company has leased the facility from the ports of Auckland uh, since that date. However, the lease terminated in March 2017 and to date a new lease has not been entered into. Uh, entered into. There are significant advantages to Auckland City to have, the, to have its rescue services co-located. Mechanics Bay, in our opinion, is an important part of the infrastructure and it would be more appropriate that it is owned by the city rather than ports of Auckland. Ports of Auckland are unable to commit to the long-term survival of Mechanics, Mechanics Bay facility. They are required to make a commercial return on their investment at Mechanics Bay. As a result of their ownership, there is no security of tenure for a vital part of the city's infrastructure. The cost of tenancy becomes increasingly difficult for charitable organisations. And because of the long-term, lack of long-term security, capital investment 
required to upgrade facilities cannot be made. I believe the time has come for Auckland City to consider owning, taking ownership at Mechanics Bay and for the emergency precinct that is already established there to be developed to its potential. Thank you for your time and uh, I invite questions. Thank you, Greg. <coughs> Greg, um, the sale, or one assumes, uh, the sale of your older helicopters, will that bridge the gap um, towards the funding of the... Uh, yes, it will. It won't be quite, <coughs> it won't quite get us there. At all <coughs> um, almost, yep. We will, um, but we're very comfortable with our debt levels. Um, as I said, we will have uh, somewhere between 85 and 90 per cent equity in this new equipment and cash flowing um, the debt over a five year repayment period is, is, is well within our capabilities. But is the, the debt that you have or um, will have, is that covered by the helicopter sales? Uh, not, not entirely, oh, no. Not quite, no, but no. quite close. Quite close, yep. yeah. Okay. Yep. Excellent. <clears throat> Yes, Councillor Darby and then Meg on. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your presentation and, and thanks for the huge work that you've been putting in over the last year. Thank you. Uh, so look, there's just a couple of outstanding things there for me and you have covered them and I appreciate you getting the message that they needed to be covered. Thank you. In terms of the uh, acquisition without um, guarantee of contract, that procurement is not resolved. Um, and then there's the other issue of no security of tenure, uh, yet you're embarking on an acquisition. Um, so you've discussed that with ARAFA and the, the funding board and they are comfortable with that direction, not having security of your real estate uh, or your contract? Um, I, I believe I've discussed that with ARAFA. I just need to be clear on that. But, but I've kept ARAFA informed of the process of the um, procurement process being run by central government and as I said in my presentation that has dragged and it continues to drag um, so I'm confident I've discussed that with the RAFA um, regarding our the, the security at Mechanics Bay it's really become an issue I suppose uh, more recently where our, our, our um, lease expired in 2017 in March and we've had um, a lot of difficulty um, renewing it and um, so that probably hasn't been quite so even to a raffer um, but it's um, the, the position is at the moment is that Ports of Auckland um, ha offered us a lease which we, we have rejected but we've gone back with um, a, a, a counter proposal and we're very close on the dollars um, but there was some other issues that um, our legal advice was not to enter that, into that agreement. So I would say the position with the ports is, is that we're close to achieving a two-year extension or two-year new lease. Um, but but the difficulty with that, councillor, is is that it doesn't give us any opportunity to develop the site and, and make some improvements which we think are necessary. And I do think that it is quite a unique collective emergency services operating out there, and I think it's a really great opportunity for the city to um, to actually secure an emergency precinct, which at the moment the city does not have security over. So um, you and others that are affected in your little precinct there, a yep. uh, very important precinct, um, are you collectively submitting to the port's draft 30-year master plan on that particular point? Because I don't see my uh, no. reading of the master plan as it doesn't include your area. So it would suggest that it's not critical port activity area. Well, I, I think you're dead right. I don't think it is critical port activity. It's clearly not critical port activity area. Um, I think that we're um, perhaps an appendix, an appendage to the port that um, they probably, to be fair, there's probably not else, a lot else they can use that land for. So we sit there comfortably with that. But, but there is no benefit to the port um, at all for us to be operating a helipad at the end of their, their Just lease not, not or their a, land. Not, we don't have a lot of time now, but yeah. uh, can I invite you and the others that are affected to write to the council yeah. about that issue and also to make Thank a you. submission on the draft master plan, yes. which is out for public engagement now. 
Thank you. Mr. Chair, I think there's something for us to pick up there. Yeah, yep, I most definitely. And um, the, the issue is, I hear what you say, that we should buy it, but we already own it because uh, we own the port. So I don't think there's any <coughs> worry that you're going to be booted out um, by the council agreeing to Auckland Ports doing that, and uh, there would be public outcry on top of it. So um, I think in the immediate term, there's no issue. We own the ports of Auckland. Let us be quite clear. And if it's not clear to the public, <coughs> we're making it quite clear. So, Mayor Goff. Yeah, if I can comment on the same issue and ask a question, Mr Chair, we may own the points of Auck ports of Auckland, but the ports legislation uh, actually restricts and, in fact, requires us not to interfere with their commercial <laughs> operation. So we have no say over uh, the use of the land. But can I just ask a question around that? My understanding, look, uh, first of all, thank you for the work you do. Thank you. And I think it's really important to have that cluster of, uh, of organisations down there, all of whom serve our city, and therefore, I, I think everybody around this table would want to see uh, your tenure of, uh, uh, of, that, of that particular space preserved, if at all possible. My understanding from the ports is that they are potentially intending to redevelop that part of the land for their headquarters building, and that's the reason why they won't extend uh, the lease beyond what they've offered you. Is that your understanding? Uh, uh, not quite. My, our understanding is, is that they, they want to develop um, <coughs> their head, headquarters in a new workshop uh, mm -hmm. deeper with, inside the port, yep. um, and, but conditional on them getting whatever approvals they need to do that, then they would let us have the land. So we're being used as a backstop, I think, is probably... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I think that is the problem. So I, I'm not sure whether the option uh, is going to be available to us. I mean, ironically, if we buy the land, we pay Ports of Auckland, but the Ports of Auckland, because we are the 100% shareholder in them, uh, that would be reflected uh, potentially back in, uh, uh, partially at least, in, in uh, their dividend to us. Have you made inquiries as one, as to the potential purchase price of that land, and two, should the ports decide they don't need to develop that part of their holdings, whether at that point they might be prepared to enter into a long-term lease with you? Well, that, that is what they've indicated, that if, if, they, don't, um, if they don't need that land, they, they, they have, they've had indicated in the past that they would enter into a long-term agreement and I just point out that in the response to our uh, that we've given back to them we've insisted that's included that, okay. that if that becomes available that they will give us first right of refusal mm -hmm. um, if they if they intended to sell it or if they intended to lease it or both well, well both yeah. both <clears throat> yeah okay uh, and what sort of lease would you need in order to... I, I know your, your, your quarter's down there pretty cramped. I've visited you down there. Yeah. Uh, what sort of lease would you need to have the confidence to actually uh, rebuild a purpose-built facility? Well, I think that's there? the same as any commercial investment, really, isn't it? I think that you, you, the, the, the longer tenure you can get, the, the greater security we've got. But, but we're hoping that it'll be in the 30-year type okay. um, league. Great. Um, look, uh, I'm... Really happy through uh, chair of our planning committee, Chris Darby, to enter into further discussions. The the only difficulty that I foreshadow is that we cannot actually, by law, direct the port what to do. Understood. We we can, of course, encourage them. Yeah, appreciate that, and I appreciate your encouragement. And thank you for your questions. Thank you. So you might want to just have a little chat on the side to the deputy prime minister. Okay, there are no further questions. I don't think so. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Oh, no, but sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. no. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you much. For the work you're doing, you Thank guys you doing, much. and pass that on to the Great board. Job. Right. Ah. Ah. Drowning Prevention Auckland, Water Safe Auckland, Inc. David, David Bray, um, and sorry, and if you could please introduce. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this update on Drowning Prevention Auckland. I'm Devon Bray, Chief Executive, and with me today is our Board Chair, Dr Denise Atkins. Uh, firstly, thank you to Auckland Council and the RAFA Board for their continued and ongoing support. Uh, very much appreciated. Drowning Prevention Auckland is the lead and only agency in Auckland with the sole purpose of working towards to reduce the number of drownings to residents and visitors to our beautiful coastline and waterways. 
Droning remains the fourth highest cause of accidental death in New Zealand after motor vehicle accidents, falls and poisoning. Our vision is a water safe Auckland free from drowning. Our mission is to prevent drowning through education. The social and financial cost of drowning is huge, not only with the loss of loved ones to friends and whanau, but also potential loss of income. A drowning fatality comes at a calculated cost of 3.95 million, but the costs to those who suffer long-term medical issues as a result of a non-fatal drowning are significantly higher. ACC, who look after such cases, state that if a child under the age of five suffers long-term morbidity as a result of a non-fatal drowning, they set aside $54 million, which is the average cost of care for the remainder of their life. 2017 was not a great year statistically for the drowning rate in either Auckland or New Zealand, with both recording six-year highs. Auckland, however, has the second lowest rate of drownings in New Zealand, with 1.3 per 100,000 of population. Proof that the message is actually getting through and that we are achieving collective impact on the drowning toll. We're getting the message out there and we do this through our five main channels of engagement. One is community programs, education and advocacy. We have 52 life jacket hubs in multiple locations across Auckland. Many of those are in churches or community centres. Our Life Jacket Loan Scheme has enabled more than 40,000 Life Jacket experiences in the last year alone. And we are partnering with Auckland Council and Surf Life Saving Northern Region in a joint rock, safe, rock fishing safety task force aimed at getting land-based fishermen to wear life jackets and engage in other safe behaviours. It's in its 12th year and we have seen a real increase in the amount of rock fishermen wearing life jackets and a real decrease in live lost while fishing. Rock fisher deaths attributed to 2.9% of Auckland's drowning toll, well below the average of 68 for the remainder of New Zealand. Number two is the formal education sector. We're very active within all areas of the education sector, from early childhood through to tertiary. This year alone, we have visited over 70 early childhood <coughs> education centres. In conjunction with the John Walker Find Your Field of Dreams Foundation, we will be visiting 90, over 90 primary schools in the South Auckland area, delivering water safety programs to the children as well as professional learning sessions to their teachers. Research, we're continually evaluating our programs and our participants to ensure that the programs remain relevant, the content appropriate, and that our participants actually take learning outcomes from our programs. In addition, we research areas that will provide evidence needed to advocate preventative measures to reduce drowning, for example, in Maori and Pacific youth. Workplace. We offer water safety training programs for people who work in, on and around the water. We delivered <coughs> to over 550 participants last year, including representatives from Watercare, Auckland Council and the Department of Conf Conservation. The number of participants and organisations using these courses is growing year on year. For example, now it's a requirement for all dock staff heading up to Roll Island to do our two-day coastal awareness course, which we hold at Bethel's Beach. Marketing communications. We communicate with residents, visitors, partners and stakeholders via multiple channels in an effort to bring our stories and messages to life across numerous channels. Most importantly, our online presence. This includes social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, inter interactive water safety activities at community events, radio interviews, media releases, forums and research publications. We are also a member of the National Cross-Sector Reference Communication Subcommittee, which helps leverage our collective efforts in reducing the drowning toll, generating positive social change in a way people behave on in and around the water. Our numbers. Uh, DPA has a team of six aquatic educators who deliver programs across Auckland. We also have a team of 20 aquatic ambassadors who, and who operate our 25 plus events each year. In 2017, Drone Prevention Auckland delivered water safety messages to just over 12,000 people across all of our channels of engagement. In this current year to date, we have delivered water safety messages to over 21,000 people. Many of the new initiatives we have implemented this year, and I'll talk to you shortly, have led to this large increase. 2017-18, we have seen DPA develop many new initiatives and programs which both align to our values and mission, but also go a long way towards our financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. Pull lifeguard training. 
we are one of the on of only a few organisations nationally who are able to provide lifeguard training without operating from a pool. We are partnered with Auckland Council's leisure centre providers to provide this training. Belgravia Leisure, for example, now use DPA to provide all of their lifeguard and first aid training. In addition to our lifeguard training, we are looking to establish our lifeguard temp agency to help all of Auckland's pools, who for the last few years have all struggled to find and retain enough employees. The temp agency is all will also provide a great avenue for Auckland's youth with both training and employment opportunities. In conjunction with John Walker Find Your Field of Dreams Trust, we have started to specifically target high school students within the South Auckland area. The students fall within the 15 to 24 year old age group, which is statistically the highest age group for drowning in New Zealand. This pilot program will target year 10 students in 16 high schools <coughs> in specific classroom based sessions designed to highlight to the students how it is safe to use our waterways. Most, if not all, of the learn to swim and water safety education available is for primary school age children, with secondary school age children seemingly forgotten about at just the time when they start to gain independence and venture into the world. We will look to roll this program across all of Auckland's high schools in 2018-2019. Water Safety New Zealand and DPA have been working through an Auckland-wide plan over the past 12 months. This has resulted in a number of recommendations for the Auckland region. The main result of this Auckland plan will be the formalisation of a Northern Region Drowning Alliance, made up of main agencies within the Auckland's water safety sector. These agents will include Coast Guard Northern Region, Coast Guard Boating Education and Surf Life Saving Northern Region. Major funders within the Auckland region have already indicated they are more interested in funding a multi-agency approach such as this alliance. This alliance will also result in greater outcomes and results long term. And finally, we, we held a hui last week at Ngāti Whātua Araki Marae uh, in, as part of a larger piece of work around an Auckland-based Maori water safety strategy. Uh, the results of the Auckland-based strategy will have wider reaching implications and is the lead piece of work focused on a national strategy in conjunction with Water Safety New Zealand. Drone Prevention in Auckland will roll out programs for the Marae members and their whānau, which will include kai gathering, waka armour, rock safety rock fishing safety. We will also be estab establishing a life jacket hub on the Marae that the community can access. So thank you and welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Anita, is there anything you wish to? No, I no, nothing? Okay. So Foundation North are no doubt very pleased with that last point that you made of bringing together of the agencies. Uh, yes, they are. Something they've been long wanting to coordinate with. Yeah, they, and they have indicated they're happy to fund into it. Excellent. Oh, I think you're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't ask for any more money. There are no, uh, <coughs> there are no questions. And yes, no. So thank you very much. Obviously, everyone Friendly. thinks you're doing a fantastic job. So, so thank you to you and the team yeah. and the board. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Bern, Anita, and Victoria, and Christine, do you want to come up or say anything or? Please come up and sit and uh, introduce yourself. I will yourself. invite the, the rest of the board up. Uh, yes, come on. Jim, yes. do you want to stand, board members, so the councillors know who to blame? Uh, <laughs> oh, we're precious as well. Yes, <laughs> okay. Jim, no, no, really, just to say thank you uh, again, and uh, uh, just just around some of those questions. I know things will come to mind after today. Uh, uh, we're always open to uh, councillors phoning, uh, asking questions, and I'm sure all the amenities are. A, uh, and to, including the Maritime Museum, uh, open to councillors um, uh, talking to them about issues that they're currently facing. So once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'll, I'll also uh, extend the invitation to new councillors. Uh, I'm only too happy to brief you on what's been going on over the last seven or eight years, if that is <coughs> something that you desire. So thank you uh, again, Mr Chairman. OK, thank you, Vern. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, board members. Right, we uh, um, I, not so much a question. I, I just note that the advertisements have been placed um, for the new members, the RAF board, and um, I just wanted to make sure that um, the chair, that w whether there was anything else that we should be aware of in terms of the process that we're about to enter into, in light of the the information that we've had today. 
So, Vern, other than telling us you're going to Cambridge, deserting us, um, is there anything else you'd like to add? I, to I still hold dual residency, uh, <laughs> Mr Chairman, more in Auckland than in the Waikato, I have to say. Um, I, uh, Councillor Fetch, and I think the, the, everything's in place. Uh, it's a joint process between Auckland Council and the Amenities Board, which I think is, is, is refreshing and great to see. Uh, it'll give the opportunity for both of those organisations to uh, look at the broad skills required. Uh, we're losing uh, uh, Diane Maloney, who has got a huge amount, Diane's here, who has got a huge amount of, um, of skills in the community area uh, and a, a very deep four decade, I think, uh, understanding of local government and how it works. So we're, we're uh, in terms of, if you're thinking about uh, shoulder tapping anyone in your communities, I think community focused an understanding of local government uh, is the sort of sort of people that we are looking at, uh, in addition to the normal skills of you know financial acumen and the like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vern, wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. Councillor Casey. Oh well, yeah, I didn't realise if we were getting to ask questions. It was just Vern. You're Neither obviously here. <laughs> <laughs> you're obviously here for the discussion with the APO with regard to the kind of poor wages being paid to the musicians and their lack of unionship union membership. Can you, um, can you tell me what RAFA intend to do about that issue? Because it is a very real issue. It's been raised here. It, it would be of concern to me and others. And Certainly. It, how is it it's, to be it's fixed? All I can, all I can say uh, through you, uh, Mr Chairman, is that it's a, an ongoing conversation. Uh, and it is not as simple uh, as, as none of these things ever are. Uh, as simply writing out a cheque or uh, all the likes. But any conversations, certainly the Chairman and I have discussed it, uh, as we have done with the Deputy Chair, uh, so it's an ongoing conversation. Doesn't... Uh, just, um, we're thinking about... Yeah, that... I think... <laughs> I think this... It's the message that's been passed on, Councillor Casey, in, in, in several forums, so that the Board is aware of um, the Councillor's concern. So, yeah. Meg off, do you have a question? No, just a, a, a thank you to Vern and all of the board for the services they give to council. I know you don't have an easy <coughs> task. Um, there's always much more demand than there is ability to, uh, to meet that demand, but we, we really appreciate the way in which you go about your task and the service that all of you give to the city. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Vern. Mr Chairman. Thank you. Right, um, councillors, what we're going to do is we're going to have Angela up and to, to give the local board input, which is to, uh, before item 11, oh, sorry, sorry, <coughs> we need a mover and a seconder to thank those, Councillor Fletcher and, and Councillor Simpson are seconding. All those in favour with the thank you resolution. All right? All right. All right, good. Thank you, right. So we're going to have Angela up, and then after Angela presents, we will then have a five to ten minute break, because that will be <coughs> for health and safety reasons over two hours. So, um, and then we'll come back and Panuku will resume on item number 11. Reasons. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Councillor Coe. It's uh, fortuitous that the chair of my steering group is here. I'd like to invite him up to sit next to me. Yep. <laughs> Lee Orton. Oh, we've seen him already. So. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was lucky, just luck. Um, good morning, Councillor Chloe, Your Worship, uh, members of the IMSB and councillors. Um, I'm here today just to speak to item 11, your next item, which is progressing urban development. So I'm just going to start with a really quick intro, and then I'm going to put up the ask that I have for you, and then I'm going to give you the context for that ask. I'll look at everyone at the same time. Um, so uh, the context of Lee being here is you may remember that I've come to speak to you several times before and I've talked about the Manurewa Town Centre Steering Group and the work that we've been doing out in the Town Centre. Um, the steering group is chaired by Lee and we've been working together for three or four years and I really value his uh, leadership and mentoring along that journey. So the uh, item 11. Uh, the reinvestment strategy itself seems really sound, sure and um, we acknowledge that P uh, Panuku doesn't have the resources to, to develop every town centre in Auckland, and that there is a need to prioritise, and um, it means that some of us will miss out on that. So today, the ask that I have for you from my board was, is that the councillors consider giving effect to the IAP, the Integrated Area Plan, that we have just concluded, and you've adopted, 
into the inclusion uh, of the Transform Manukau boundary. So we're asking, we're going to ask for an extension of the Transform Manukau boundary down to Timahia train station. The current Transform Manukau boundary already extends two kilometres into the Manurewa Ward boundary. So I'm um, asking that we just extend that a little further to encompass the town centre and Timahi train station. So I'll give you some context around that. Um, the Panuku strategy seems to be the default Auckland development strategy. It needs to be built on and have regard to all of the plans and the strategies that have gone before it and that we've already taken out and consulted on with the public. Uh, as an example, the Auckland Plan 2012 stated that the Southern Initiative, uh, as stated that Southern Initiative is one of the two place-based initiatives that was going to transform the South. Um, it's acknowledged that the success of the South Auckland is extricably tied to the success of, of Auckland. Um, unfortunately, the Auckland Plan doesn't uh, give it the same um, allocation. It's really moved to a, a place-based initiative with its focus. It's not place-based, its focus has changed to being social innovation and entrepreneurship. So we've, we've lost, lost that place-based base. The Manurewa Takanini Papakura Spatial Priority Area is one of nine spatial priority areas that are committed to an Auckland Council's long-term plan 2012-2022. And the public were told that the council defined spatial priority areas to ensure that council's limited resources had and will continue to be put into those areas. And that will enable multiple of outcomes to align with the Auckland Plan's development strategy and the six transformational shifts. So we, um, we were working towards that, delivering outcomes alongside the transformational shifts. Based on the spatial priority areas, the Manurewa and Papakura local boards supported the development of the integrated area plan. We've consulted widely with all, through both communities, Papakura and Manurewa. One of the best consultations I've ever seen in local government. Um, and so good that it has just won the NZPI award. And um, the guys that worked on that were incredible. They reached people in our community that um, we haven't been able to reach ourselves as well as what they did. So we got some extremely rich feedback on what people want our, their places that they live in to be. So the plan was adopted in 2017, IAP, and I think there's an awards ceremony now that the planning team have gone down to collect. So we're saying yes, you need to prioritise, but please don't all, ignore all the work that has gone on before uh, by the other local boards. Transformation of Manukau is a key part of Panuku strategy and it occurs in the Otara, Papatotoi and Manurewa local board areas. And as I've said, it already comes two kilometres into my local board area. Um, the development of Manukau though, it does have some flow and effect on the Manurewa Town Centre and we saw that years ago when Manukau uh, City Centre first came to be. We saw the impact on the Town Centre. With more capital development um, opportunities and energy, and fl energy flowing towards Manukau, we will continue to have a detrimental effect on our Town Centre. So to address all of that, we did form the steering group three or four years ago and on that steering group and um, I've mentioned it before, we have brought together council family and we have people that are advising us from outside the council family. We have private and public sector stakeholders that are, helped us, are helping us inform the development of our town centre. So we've already had some, some significant gains in beautification, transport improvements, connectivity, business precinct development. We've prioritised our transport capital investment through the partnership with AT to build the covered walkway from our shopping centre to the train station to increase that patronage onto the train station. Our current investment is committed to the redevelopment of Timahia train station, which was scheduled to be decommissioned. These relationships enable leverage to, ma <coughs> to maximise the local board's capital funds and the current project at Timahia has seen a dollar for dollar match the local board's capital fund with Auckland Transport to enable a $5 million project to a station that was once going to be commissioned. The work that we do is aligned to the Auckland plan, the unitary plan, it's backed by business cases, it's informed by subject <coughs> matter experts from both within and outside council. 
And so now, a few years down the track, we see ourselves in a phase where residential property developers are exploring, exploring two key sites in Manarewa for apartment living. One is a 10-storey <coughs> development, a meeting I'm missing at the moment, on private land directly on the so southeastern side of the rail corridor. And another recent opportunity has arisen on the northern e northeastern side of the rail corridor, which is also of interest to a residential property developer. Due to the increase in our patronage and more recently the allocation of bus layovers as the result of this new Southern Bus Network, we've realised an extended responsibility to provide additional safe parking for our commuters. To do this we need to explore how we might utilise our non-surface Auckland transport assets on the northeastern rail corridor of our train station. Furthermore, there is a three-way partnership and that is providing us with an opportunity to optimise an Auckland Transport suboptimal land asset along the rail corridor northeast of the train station. So this non-forced market-driven activity can't be supported without the involvement of Panuku and the ability to optimise and reinvest our current assets. An extension of the Transform Manukau initiative a few hundred metres south will allow, will allow the human and intellectual capital from the years of work on our town centre steering group to be harnessed mm -hmm. to address any spillover effects of Manukau's transformation on Manurewa and leverage off the planned and private public investment schedule <coughs> for the town centre. The optimisation of options in the town centre to support the work of our steering group. We've got council owned property holdings in the town centre through Auckland Transport in and around the transport hub <coughs> and the corporate portfolio on Hill Road where the local board office and library are based. These holdings offer an opportunity for optimisation of both non-service and service assets where there is a mix of corporate, community and commercial outcomes can be achieved to support the regeneration of the Manu River Town Centre. The local board can, uh, can advocate and it can invest, but it needs the support of Panuku. Panuku agreed in principle during the, during the development of the Integrated Area Plan in 2017 to consider integrating the Transform Manukau and IAP boundaries to identify opportunities through the connection. So just in closing, just the ask again, the ask is that considering the work that the Town <laughs> Centre Steering Group has been achieving um, methodically and pragmatically and, and um, <coughs> taking into consideration the, the plans, the go-to plans, we're asking that councillors give effect to the integrated area plan through the inclusion of the Manurewa Town Centre down to Timahi train station into Transform Manukau so we, continue to, we can continue to work with our private and public property developers. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Angela. Lee, is there anything you wish to add? Uh, I won't take too much of your time, but, but can I say, um, I, the, the programme that we've been running, Steering Group, and can I say I also do the same in, um, in Papakura Local Board, and that's a metropolitan okay. centre, yeah. um, and we have a number of work streams <laughs> working with the local board there, and I think there's, a, there's another conversation to be had further south. But I think the model that we use, which is about using all the family of the council, um, working developing relationship with Auckland Transport, and I, can I say that's been a very productive um, relationship. And with Panuku, uh, which um, Angela's just referred to as the other part of the, the jigsaw there, you know, we have actually done the planning. It's the bottom up, so you get the big picture, strategic from the, from the governing entity, and then you get the bottom up working across in detail through. I think it's a very effective model. Um, and so we are just looking for some extra tools uh, in terms of that um, a re reinvestment in the town centre, and can I articulate on behalf of Papakura uh, <coughs> Local Board, um, the same uh, issue will, will arise uh, there and, and in some ways the issues of, of Papakura as a metropolitan centre are, are somewhat um, more challenging than uh, in Manarewa. Mm. So I'll leave it there. So Lee, you, um, you, you realise and you recognise that Manurewa and Papakura and, um, um, is at this stage not even in the support level of, um, so, so yeah. what's been requested is to come from basically the rear of the field, and there's nothing wrong with asking, to, to basically go up to equal first place and transform, give them a transform, unlock, support, and then unfortunately those that are not mentioned, so sure. that's recognised. Where they're not mentioned, we recognise. Councillor Newman. Thank you, good presentation. You've come with a pragmatic option today, but just can I just, uh, two questions from me. Um, does the, 
does the draft 10-year plan with respect to giving effect to the IAP provide a program of funding for the kind of transformations that you're requesting outside the transform and unlock program that Panuku is pursuing? Not that I can see, no. Okay. And secondly, could you just give some scope as to the level of capital funding commitment that has been made so far to um, not only undertake the capital works for the Timahia train station, but also the connectivity uh, from the commercial retail centre at Manurewa through to the train station and, and the, bus, the bus interchange? That's probably a total spend of four and a, four and a half million dollars from the board. Um, we've had um, input from Auckland Transport for the Timahia, which is two and a half million, and our capital fund, which we have been saving for a rainy day, is investment into the town centre. We have had good support from AT and Economic Development in terms of helping us with some of that beautification to encourage people from Great South Road through the shopping centre through to the train station. We're lucky we got moved up uh, the line with getting the gates. Um, we're getting some good wins on the board locally. We, we really are. and we, we just want to be able to leverage off the interest that we have now from private developers without public assets and private. Or, sorry, can I just... Supplementary, if I may. Did you say that you put <coughs> four and a half million of your local transport? Oh, the, from the transport. <coughs> Incredible. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Supported. Thank you, um, Chair Angela, for your presentation and Lee. Um, I just want to know why it wasn't included in Transform Monaco. I'm sorry, um, you. And what about Clendon? Uh, so the steering, the, in terms of the steering group, Clendon is now part of the, the steering group model. So we've, we've got little branches, we've got our homelessness work stream, um, and we have Clendon. So whatever we do within the town centre, we are replicating in Clendon the beauty of having a town centre manager who can work across both towns. So we're bringing Clendon along on the journey. Um, <coughs> it, won't, it, it wouldn't form part of that transform boundary. The transform boundary is quite clearly down the IAP, which is down uh, Great South Road, the Great South Road corridor. Okay. Yeah, Clendon is uh, very much a private investment, and we've found ourselves a bit restricted, but we're doing what we can with them. Yeah. Councillor Cashmore. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Good presentation, Angela. Thank you. And congratulations to you and your board and Lee on the work. Um, what is your board's view on the apartments that have been suggested by the private developers? In terms of? Would you support the idea of apartments throughout the town centre? Or, or? Well, we support the idea of apartments alongside the rail corridor, as you know was um, touted in the Auckland Plan Unitary Plan. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, we will give effect to what has been approved by the governing body. And my second question, Mr Chairman, is with what you've done, the work that Lee's done for you, that will not stand up on its own with a, de with a development around the town centre. You need the other funds to come in from the Manukau to make it work. Is that, the pri that, the that the line? Oh, yeah, sorry, Councillor. Um, the private development is being driven um, mostly by our town centre manager, um, uh, who has so no need for funds in that respect. But <coughs> what it does do is, is push some of the, for, as an example, parking uh, down to the northern side of the train station and we have some Auckland Transport non-service assets there that we could use to optimise safer car parking. As an example, another example is a development uh, by a community um, in partnership with an architect uh, for a centre that is on some land that is available, that is Auckland Transport land. So you can't do this work you're trying to do without... You won't stand up on its own is what I'm asking. You can't oh, do it. yeah, you're correct. Yeah, we need to be able to optimise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, I, can I just respond, um, uh, Councillor Cashmore? I think, I think we need um, the other, you know, the development arm of the council alongside, and I'll talk about both those, those, those centres to actually facilitate and leverage. You know, the, we are doing the local planning with, with the council family, and we actually know what we want to achieve, but what we do know is that it just needs that other part, um, Panuku, to actually be enabled to actually help us meet 
what the, the planning and the aspiration is. And, and as I say, we're, can I speak on behalf of Papakura, that, that's a lot further to go yet. Um, we are doing the planning um, uh, f for it. But in, in my view, it does need some quite considerable assistance <coughs> uh, you know, with the Auckland Council, with, with Panuku and with the different, different arms. And it may be part of the conversations, I'm looking aspirationally, that you may well be having with the new government in terms of some of their aspirations about you know, unlocking um, you know, the, the challenges that uh, a Papakura town centre has. Munro has been through that process with the Monaco uh, city centre. But Papakura has got some enormous challenges with huge development in Drury. Kiwi income have bought their 52 hectares, Takanini, et cetera, et cetera. So it's what the Auckland Council wants to achieve out of its one of its 15 metropolitan centres with the highest vacancy rates, et cetera, et cetera. I just think it needs, we need some, just a bit more in our armoury to actually unlock, you know, the potential and the redevelopment of, of a centre like Papakura and Manarewa. I think, Mr Chair, just because the area isn't in the unlock does not mean it's excluded from Panuka's activities. And um, there are many councillors around this area who are helping with their communities and developers to drive um, re reforms, changes and improvements to their communities. But you know, I've got, I'll have some questions for Mr Rankin or whoever's presenting for PDA after this. So I'm actually looking at a, um, a map of the priority development locations and I noticed we've got Councillor Watson from the North Shore and Councillor Fletcher from <coughs> Mount Eden, but I mean, we're in the support category at the moment. We have Whangaparoa, New Lynn, Mount Eden, Otahu, Stonefields, Howard, and Pukekohe. <coughs> so that's why I'm using the analogy, you know, of Kiwi winning the World the Melbourne Cup many years ago, written off at 200 metres to go and then round <coughs> the field and bowling them all over. It's coming right, right from the back, not even supported. So I'm not saying it's not a bad thing, but we just need to be aware of that, Councillor. So, so Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And, and it's really just seeking, uh, Angela, a, a clarification of the point that Councillor Clow was making there um, in terms of uh, this you know, perceived <laughs> queue jumping uh, as opposed to a logic in expanding uh, an area that has already transformed. And uh, the way I'm reading this, and I, and I appreciate your, your, your comment, is that it's not so much queue jumping as, as a logical um, extension, uh, which, which I assume will be funded in some way by, by sale of property or, or, or assets. So, so it's, it's more or less building on what's going to happen and, and, and it makes sense to include this, this area. Is that, is that a reasonable reading of it? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you okay. for that, Councillor. That's a good summation. And I, but I, I like to think that because we've been working towards this to gear up for it three to four years <coughs> uh, at the back of the field, that we're in a good position to be able to, um, to just jump into that transform extension and, con and contribute as we have been. Oh, well, well, my question sort of follows much along the same lines. So I, I thank um, Angela and Lee for this presentation under local boards. But I was just trying to drill down in terms of understanding from your presentation whether these funds were required from Transform Manukau or whether they were to be locally sourced. And I, I, I know I'm being a bit belts and braces, but I really want to understand that and zero in on it so that I can actually vote accordingly. So if you can just really give me a bit more clarity, both of you, on that point. Uh, so for Manurewa, um we do have local assets that can be sold and reinvested into local development. That Yes, that's what we're saying. Our local assets, Auckland, Auckland Transport, which... Uh, well, I think you're asking to be brought into the Transform Unlock. Um, we have assets within the corporate portfolio. Um, so we're asset rich, but as Lee says, Papakura, not, not so well off in that department. Yeah, um, it, it is ability to, and we're not talking huge scale, I have to say, in, in the Monroe, but it is, you know, for a long time there's been this a strategic development plan. Uh, we've now operationalised it into a local, you know, detailed conceptual plan, and, and there is properties which we know we can, if we had an ability, and we're not talking megabytes, to actually 
um, move around within that town centre. You know, that's what I guess we're after. I think, as I say, Papakura is a, is a bigger, a much bigger challenge, which I do, you know, um, employ you to actually think about um, the needs of that town going, going, going further. Um, but we're not talking megabucks in, in this. No, no, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think that's been very helpful. Councillor Cooper. Um, thank you. I completely understand your desire to do this, um, and I think all transform, probably more the unlock um, places want the same. I guess for me, I mean, we're only voting to receive your request at the moment, so I'm hoping that we'll um, have some information back about this because um, there's a lot of unlocks waiting in line, and... I, I'd support this as long as it doesn't undermine any other area that are trying to get ahead. I think we've got to be fair about this. You know, we went through a very rigorous process to define all of the areas. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe lots of requests we're having means we might have to review that at some time too, actually. Maybe what we did four years ago is out of date now, but, um, you know, I support it. Mm -hmm. But I think we're not really voting on that today. We're just receiving your request. But thank you. Thanks for all the work so you've done. Just, just as explanation, it, I will say it would be alarming if we ended up undermining item 11 by asking for a reclassification and work done on the already existing program. Yeah. However, there's I'm no reason why... I'm not asking for that now, Mr no, Chairman. Because so, that would be... <laughs> A shame because it's taken such hard work to get item 11 to the table. Trust me. However, I'm just giving you there is <coughs> a um, there is an amendment which has been put up um, by Councillor Newman and seconded by Councillor Simpson that request that which we'll discuss later. Request that Panuku provide advice on the option of extending Transform Manukau to incorporate the Manuewa Town Centre and Te Mahia train station. So that is a foreshadowed that will come up. I'll just go back to what I'm saying, and it's um, I'm just this is really what I think Pranuka will be saying as well. Is that another option could be that they come back with a report on all the other areas? Because as I say, this is mm -hmm. coming from not even a support location, which neither Manuewa or Papakura are in. They are therefore in the fourth category to be elevated Getting to shot. the top category, which would be highly. Unusual, not, not if, if we did that. So, so it may be that if that <coughs> doesn't go through as an amendment, then there could be another amendment which asks for Panuku to come back with further advice through the LTP process on all the other areas, and it could be Glen Eden, <coughs> it could be plenty up on the North Shore that Councillor Watson and <coughs> Walker and Derby could probably come up with, and no doubt <coughs> Helensville, whatever. So, so. Uh, there are no more questions on this, and so I just want to move it. Oh, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry, Councillor was... Philip Anna. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and it, it may be more to Matthew, um, and it's just a discussion around assets that are within the local board area, and the selling of those assets and the monies going back into that local board area. Matthew, is is <coughs> is, is, is our current policy that uh, any asset that is to be sold and confirmed that the money goes back into that area or does it go back into the regional pot? That's, that's yeah. Can, can you clarify that? Because I know there's been um, discussions around this table, around some of the, the monies, depending on whether it's transform or not, that goes back into uh, the area that's been transformed. Thanks. Uh, so through the chair, um, the key distinction there, and you might ask David Rankin on the item to talk to it as well, the key distinction is whether it's deemed a service asset or a non-service asset. So in principle, uh, if it's an asset that's not in service, we would generally look at that as being, as being uh, capital that's freed up for overall council purposes. Uh, if it's currently in purpose, um, services have been delivered, then the work that David Rankin has put forward over the last year or so talks to an opportunity for uh, reinvestment within the area under the banner of optimisation. Okay, so that's, that's the distinction. I just wanted to get that clarified. Yep. Thank so, you. And we certainly have a very challenging um, 
well, Tanuka have a very challenging target still in the LTP yep, on top of item 11 to return sales to the consolidated pot. But clearly, and we was reflected on the other day, that we're hoping that we're going to get more cooperation and finesse from Auckland Transport to for us to access sales of Auckland Transport land that perhaps we didn't kind of think, or Panuku didn't think they would have access to. So we're hoping we can meet all that. So I'd like a move and a second to receive um, and thank, thank um, Angela and Lee, Councillor Fletcher, seconded by Councillor Bartley. Okay, all those in favour? Aye. Right, aye. well, that was, aye. that was going to be 11.30. So all those in favour, yes, aye. Thank you, Councillor Casey, that's unanimous, obviously. We'll make it um, 12 o'clock, if we can just be bang on 12 o'clock, please. Okay, because it's been two and a half hours. And I'm sorry, Panuku, um, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Well, do you want to have lunch now? That would be a good idea. Why don't you just, just have lunch now and go on to it?